This is Transistor.fm. Jackson here. So glad you could make it today. It's been a long time since we've had an episode here on the old Product People podcast. If you've been wondering where I've been, I've been doing another podcast called Build and Launch. You can check that out, buildandlaunch.net. The idea was to do an experiment where I'd be building a new product every seven days and recording my audio journal, recording what it's like every day to do that stuff, and um, just finished season two, and I'm hoping to do another season of that show, but if you haven't checked it out, the back catalog is worth listening to, I think anyway, and the episodes are really short. They're like 10 to 15 minutes, and there's usually some good takeaways, and also just, you know, uh, commiserating with someone else who is trying to build and launch his own thing. So if you're a maker, it's uh, yeah worth checking out, buildandlaunch.net. Now this episode of Product People came about because I was chatting with Nathan Barry on a Slack channel, and uh, he had just reached, I believe, $5,000 a month in recurring revenue. And this was significant for him, and uh, he has a SaaS app called ConvertKit. So I thought we'd talk. So let's do it right now. All right, so I've got Nathan Barry here, and I thought Nathan and I would jump on a call because he's kind of got this stream of consciousness going on right now <laughs> in terms of uh, announcing kind of where he's at with ConvertKit. Let's see if I can share just this tweet just so we can both look at it here. So two weeks ago, you announced that you had fit, you had hit 5K in MRR. Yep. And since then, you've added 1,200, which is awesome. And now you've also made your um, your numbers completely public. Yeah, so you can go to convertkit.barometrics.com and see everything. Just to share a little bit more of the story, mm-hmm. I've been working on ConvertKit for uh, coming up on two years because I started January 2013. Um, yeah. And... It had, if you can see the revenue numbers if you go look at, at bare metrics, but um, basically it had dropped down to about $1,200 a month. And so it was, for the first time ever, losing money because um, I'd always built it off of just revenue. Yeah. And, and it was this pain to handle. And, and, that, so, and we lost this one account that I thought should really stick with us. And, and then I, that's when I realized that our software wasn't as good as it should be because we weren't spending, you know, we weren't continuing to make it better because we didn't have the money to do that. And so I decided, okay, either put it on autopilot and move to profitable projects or double down on it and, and really focus on it. And so that's, that's when the focus came. That, right. that's, that's a big, because when you know you've got something that is bringing in uh, cash, like, like you were with books and courses, mm-hmm. and then you have this kind of thing that is completely undefined, and you know that a lot of people have failed at. There's good companies with a lot of funding that have failed at building a SaaS product. So what made you kind of tip over to, because this is a big risk for you, so what made you tip over and decide you were going to double down? Um, I had a couple ideas that I hadn't, really it came down to two things. Um, I realized that I hadn't focused on a niche and really yeah. given that a good try. And I had this niche of email marketing for authors that I wanted to try. Yeah. And, and the other thing was I felt like I'd never given ConvertKit my my absolute best shot at making it happen. It had always been a side project. 
So at MicroCon uh, last year in Vegas, Heat and Shaw asked me. He was like, "So," he he was really nice about it, but he was basically saying, "So, at what point are you going to decide like that ConvertKit failed and shut it down? Like, yeah, are you going to be honest with yourself about all of that and and put your efforts on something that you know?" Basically, he was just saying like. Make up your mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And do something. Don't hobble along for years with this thing that might not ever turn into anything. Yeah. So I was thinking about that. Obviously, it took me, what, six months later that I was really thinking about his advice. Yeah. But, um, and so I was thinking, okay, I need to feel like I really gave it my best shot before I can decide it didn't work and and shut it down. And it's a tool that I absolutely love. So shutting it down would involve, like, I'd still use it for everything, and yeah. it just, you know, it basically put it on autopilot and all of that. And so I decided, at least to give it a real shot, make it my full-time job, and mm -hmm. give it a hundred percent of my focus, and and then see. Can you give us a sense of, you know, when people are making decisions like that? It could be, you know, do I leave consulting full-time and double down on this thing? Do I leave these books and products that are doing well and double down? Do I leave my job and double down? What like what was that exact moment like for you? It, were you scared? Were you feeling like this could ruin me? Or did you just feel like kind of a confidence that you should this is what you should be doing? Uh, I was very nervous because 2014 was a, a pretty rough year for a lot of things, and I've talked about it on a few other interviews and stuff, but um, we basically were com coming coming near to the end of all of our available cash. Yeah. Um, you know, we still have healthy investments and, and things like that, but... Um, so I guess there's more that uh, that I could access, but basically, you know, we bought a house and put a sixty-five thousand dollar down payment on that, and then spent seventy thousand dollars remodeling it, and yeah. then so really by the time October came around, even though I had an amazingly successful year before that selling books and courses and all this stuff, I I basically had fifty thousand dollars left of all of our available money, um, and and so I had a and lot that's of... And that's what you invested in ConvertKit? Yeah. Wow. Okay, so this... So my bank account actually went down to about... I think I had about $6,000 total. Yeah. Um, which, from the year earlier, a year... Basically January... Well, say before I bought the house, March uh, 2014, I had like $180,000 in immediately available cash, like sitting in you know, in Wells Fargo. Yeah. Uh, and so it was a huge change to go from that to all the way down. And so we we trimmed down all of our expenses. Uh, you know, we'd been paying extra on our mortgage and, and things like that. And I cut back all of that. And my wife and I went through and, you know, just we trimmed back everything. And I was re really lucky to have her totally on board. Yeah. Um, what was that like? Like, she, when you describe things with your spouse... Like, do you just come to her and say, "Listen, we've got fifty grand left, and I'd like to push it all into this thing"? Like, how does that conversation go? Um, it went, it went well. Um, but I actually, when we started the conversation, I didn't know if she would be okay with it. You know? Yeah. And so I was really happy that that she was, because I felt like that's what I really wanted to do. But I think, I think in the conversation, I conveyed to her just how nervous I was. And because yeah. it's also this thing where it's like, hey, you know this this product that I've been trying to get off the ground for almost two years now and has not gotten much traction. Yeah. Um, now I want to take all our available money and give it to that. Yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> and so <laughs> it wasn't the most compelling pitch. Yeah. But we, you know, we talked through like what would be the worst case scenario, mm -hmm. and it wasn't that bad. Like. Yeah. You know, why was it? Why was it not that bad? You felt like you could just you could make that fifty grand back again if you needed to. Well, yeah, and actually, it was something that Hillary said where I 
she her worst case scenario was far worse than mine. Yeah. Um, because she went to, like, we have lots of family that's really close by and that we're uh, really, really close with. And so she was like, basically, you know, we can, if things really tank, we can move in with them and we'll rebuild and, you know. And I'll, and I went, oh, it'll never get that bad. Like, <laughs> you know. And so she went to this much worse case scenario of, like, yeah. of running out of all money and having to sell her house and, and all of that. And, and she was okay with that. Yeah. Wow. And that was... It was really cool when I went, oh, it, don't worry, it won't ever come to that. Like, yeah, but we'll she be able to. She's really with you in the long haul here. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I think it's that she, she gets that how much all this stuff matters to me. Yeah. And, um, you know, we. Why, why does it matter to you? Um, uh, that's a good question. So, there's a bunch of different things to it. One, the business is a challenge, and I need that continual challenge to, um, uh, just just to stay engaged in, I guess, life in general. Um, that that push, and and then I guess SaaS in particular. Um, I well, I feel like books and courses are no longer a challenge. I feel like I've got that kind that kind of locked down. And, yeah. Um, and so, looking for a new challenge. The other thing is, I've seen people in the. So I guess if we establish that I want to continually grow and mm-hmm. take on new challenges, and grow the business and all that, I looked at where the books and courses, the logical conclusion of that. Um, and I know people that have gotten to, um half a million or a couple million dollars a year in revenue off of those and I look at their business models and and how they structure everything and I don't like it. Hmm. Uh, I feel like going from a quarter million a year up to say one million a year in book and course revenue um, I don't know. It, it's just like I feel like you have to optimize just about everything to get to that number. Okay. And And so it it's diminishing returns. Um, yeah. And so if I wanted to build a substantial business, one that I could uh, grow, for, I feel like I could grow for a long time, then it needed to be something different than books and courses. Yeah. Which yeah. is always interesting, the the perspective. Because, um, you know, for a lot of people, getting to 250 k in revenue in a year would be a great achievement. But now for you, that's not... You know, you've done that, and now you're thinking about the next thing. And when you're kind of looking up, so, and we don't always have the chance to look up, do we? Because, you know, I think, it, again, if you asked someone who's kind of starting out, uh, you know, which would you rather, 250 k in book sales or a million, they would probably say, well, a million. But you're saying when you looked up that path, it wasn't exciting to you. Yeah, it was this path of having to continually do launches in order to drive a lot of revenue. All these people who are at the levels, you know, much higher than I am, they they have to do launches, and in order to run that process, they they hire a team, and then they have payroll. I know plenty of people that um, run payroll of fifty grand a month, um, and and so it's like, yeah, you're making four times as much money, but your profit margin is way lower, and you know, yeah. I I think if I were to ever stop, like say if ConvertKit were to not work out, yeah, um, I think I probably would have scaled back my courses and expenses and um, just everything that I was doing. And instead of trying to hit like surpass my number every year, yeah, and say go to four hundred thousand instead of two hundred fifty, yeah, then I think what I would do is. I think I'd try to autopilot, you know, put as much of it on autopilot, figure as many systems as possible, and kind of make that the challenge mm-hmm. rather than having to hire the team and all this stuff in order to, I don't know. The phrase that comes to mind is like, you know, squeezing blood from a stone where you're yeah. like trying to get every last bit out of this info product business Yeah. Um, was to it, get was to the, that next level. Was the info product business tiring you out? Like doing all those launches, is that why you would scale back, or just because 
Um, yeah, what maybe describe that a little bit more. Well, I guess um, I think it was tiring me out some, though it's still it's still fun and exciting. But yeah, it, it was definitely tiring me out some. Um, but I guess from where I was at, there'd be two possible challenges to go down. Mm-hmm. One would be to keep growing revenue, and the other challenge would be to put systems in place to maintain revenue or have it drop a little bit but have the business run on autopilot. And those yeah. are both very difficult things to do. And so since we've already established that I need challenge in business, yeah. um, you know, those are the two paths that I saw. And I, yeah. I think if I were to choose one of those, I would choose the um, create systems uh, path. Yeah. I We're going to get back to ConvertKit in a while, but this part is interesting to me. I've been thinking a lot about... Um, a lot of the people I look up to in business are, are kind of always thinking about doing stuff that scares them or is challenging to them. And it seems like that's kind of the path that you followed here. You, you felt like, okay, you know, I've done this, but now I really need to do something that's going to challenge me. And I wonder if that is, is that just good general advice for people in business that if you're not doing something that, you know, scares you or challenges you, you probably need to make a move? Yeah, I think so. Um, but I also think there's a time. I think I think you need to be careful to not challenge yourself too much. Um, Rob Walling put out a post I think yesterday or the day before um, about the you know the stair steps um, of different types of products. Mm-hmm. Uh, Amy Hoy always talks about stacking bricks, and it's something that's been you know this idea has been floating around our communities for a long time. Mm-hmm. But um, you know it, you got to be careful that you're not. <laughs> You know, hearing, oh, okay, I need to always be challenged, so let me go pick the biggest possible challenge and go mm-hmm. straight to that. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think that you should be doing something that challenges you. Um, you know what? I, so I play a lot of, of indoor soccer. Um, I just played a game last night, and we lost, unfortunately. But um, <laughs> we were talking, uh, my brother in law, Philip, who I play with a lot, um, we were driving to the game, and Going in, we were talking about different teams and who was playing and all this stuff. And one of us made a comment about how if you go into the game with such a good team and you're playing, because there's all these different divisions and all that, and you know going into the game that you're going to win, yeah. you're doing it wrong. Yeah. And so I think if you go into whatever whatever your challenge is and you know 100% you're going to win, then then you're not pushing yourself enough. You're not biting off a big enough challenge. And so I think um, if I continued down the course route, um, I knew 100% you know, that I was going to, whatever level of success that was, I was going to achieve it. And, and so that, that tells me that I'm not, uh, not pushing myself enough. Whereas with ConvertKit, I, I still don't know. Yeah. You know? But I know that I've got a great team, and we're gonna we have a, a solid game plan, and and we have a good chance at winning. Yeah. So let's talk a bit about what turned things around. Um, I know you've described this other places, but maybe just summarize. Like you were at twelve hundred bucks, um, and this is after you went down too, because uh, the the initial kind of your initial push with ConvertKit when you were doing the the app challenge or whatever you called it. You know, initially, that initial traction you got seemed like, man, he's getting, he actually is doing it. Like, um, I felt you were, you were pretty close at that time, and then you went down. So how, yeah. did, it, how did it recover? Um, so as far as the numbers, I think we, I had thought when I wrote those initial numbers that we had peaked at um, 2,500. We'd actually peaked at more like 2,000. I was calculating monthly recurring revenue incorrectly. Gotcha. Um, which Because we had like pre-orders coming from some sources and it was kind of a mess and looking back I realized I had made a mistake on how I was calculating it. Yeah. Um, uh, actually Thomas Fuchs pointed, was the one who pointed out my math errors. And Anyway. Um, that stuff so, is very complicated to, to calculate actually. It's yeah. Still- like stuff like bare metrics came out. It was everyone said they knew their number, but when you actually dug down, a lot of people did not actually understand 
the numbers that were underneath. There's so many factors. Yeah, and that's exactly what what I encountered. So revenue from about that 2000, it hung around there for a while, went up and down, and we tried a, a ton of different things. It wasn't like we totally slacked off on um, on building the product or you know all of that. We tried lots of things, and again and again, I thought that I had hit something that was going to work, like with ConvertKit Academy and all these different ideas. But um, and uh, so we tried all of that. It went up and down, but basically by October 2014, we were at 1,200 a month, and that's when um, another good friend, Tim Grawl, encouraged me. We were on a call, and he was asking about. Um, asking me about ConvertKit because he had signed up for the product and really liked it. Okay, and Tim is a he's a book guy. He's a, yeah he promotes books, good at marketing books. Yeah, um, one of Tim's claims to fame is well, he he has tons of authors as clients. Yeah, and so he at one point he had five uh, client books on the New York Times bestseller list at the same time. Yeah, um, so Tim's so, very good at what he does. Yeah, and he loved it. Yeah, and and he said you have a good thing here, but with your current marketing, it's not going to go anywhere. And so he really encouraged me to pick a a niche of some kind, and and he said designers because he knew that I was a designer and that was the thing that he had, you know that he most closely associated with me. Yeah, and I said, well, actually, I think it's authors because yeah. um, it's best for the people, you know. Like myself, like you, Justin, um, you know, we want to write a technical book of some kind. We, you know, we need to build an audience of, say, two or three thousand people in order to do that, and then, you know, that whole thing. And that's who that's who I am. That's who I built the product for. Yeah. And so I picked this term of authors, and that actually that helped a lot. So we changed it instead of being like some, I don't know what the the homepage statement title was before. Yeah. But you know, it's something about quickly growing your list or blah blah blah. And we just said email marketing for authors. Yeah. And that let us have conversations with a lot of really remarkable people who are doing really well in the author space and um we were able to do some webinars with different people and like nothing was a home run. Yeah. But we started to get real traction. And if you look in in our numbers you can see October, November December, um, yeah. there's fairly significant growth. This is actually I'm following as you're talking. I'm following along on bare metrics. <laughs> it's pretty, it's pretty awesome. Um, so you started to get some traction. I can see that there's a. I mean, I could even share the screen, although anyone listening on audio wouldn't see it. But you know, you start to see. You know, right along here, there's a definitely an inflection point, mm-hmm. and things start to go up. So, yeah. so, and... Oh, man, look at that curve at the end. That's looking nice. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> this is looking really great. So, so that was authors, and then you recently changed it again. Right. Uh, oh, and that was a result of the... the, the um, of the mastermind group. Yeah, so what happened there? Why, why, why the change? Okay, so... Um, well, before we get to that, there's one other thing that I want to I touch on. And, yeah. Um, so we had really great through, growth through... Uh, through December and into the first half of January, and just fantastic growth in the first half of January. And then I went on on um, I went on vacation for two weeks to go visit my family or my extended family in Thailand. And the great thing was the business ran perfectly. Like all kinds of bad things happened, and my team handled it all wonderfully. And so, like every other day, I would read through the Slack. Channel and be like, ooh, that's terrible. That ha- <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Yeah, they nicely handled, guys. And so that was fantastic. The downside was that all growth completely stopped, and we mm. just leveled off. And so you you can see that mid January in the MRR chart. Um, so then we end of December, early January, we started noticing that there we were finding our perfect customer. And they didn't identify with the term author. Hmm. I would consider some of them authors, 
Um, yeah. But that wasn't the term that they identified with. And so we started playing around with a bunch of different terms, um, like course creator. Um, you know, there were these people, the people who said they were authors were writing fiction books and trying to sell them on Amazon for two bucks a piece. Yeah. And, and then the, the people that were really successful at it, maybe they had one book. Or they maybe they were like a Chris Gillibo where they had some really popular traditionally published books, yeah. but they made really a lot of money from the courses. Yeah. So then we were like, okay, just trying to figure out what term this person identifies from. Because we realized that we actually scared away a lot of potential customers where I'd reach out to them. and Because I was doing a ton of direct sales. That's yeah. the thing we haven't talked about um, of how all this growth came. So lots of direct sales. And I'd say, hey, check out ConvertKit. Um, and then I'd link them, you know, they'd go to the site. So we'd be having this conversation where they're like, oh, this sounds really good, and then you go to the site and be like, mm, authors? I'm not really an author. And I'm like, yeah. well, but you kind of are because of, you know, you're writing all this, you make your living from writing and teaching. Yeah. Um, so you're trying to convince them, but they're saying, no, that doesn't really resonate with me. Right. And so um, I was having a, a conversation with a friend, um, his name's Sean Ogle. He writes a blog at uh, location180.com, something like that. Okay. Uh, uh, great guy. And he runs in the whole... He's one of the co-organizers of the World Domination Summit, uh, along with Chris Gillibo and other people. Okay, um, yeah. And so that was the first time that I really realized that we had this messaging problem. Because he was saying, the product sounds great, the marketing tells me it's not for me. And I'm like, no, no, no. You fit our exact customer really well because we found that we needed people who would switch to ConvertKit, mm -hmm. right? Because someone who starts email marketing, they're going to look at $29 a month as really expensive. Um, it's They're going to see if it works out. They're not going to have a habit of writing or an audience or any of this stuff, and so there's a good chance they'll churn out. Yeah. Um, you can still see all of those people reflected in our churn numbers. Um but the people that were great were the ones that would bring over uh, 40,000 subscribers in one go. And yeah. and they just looked at it as like, is it a similar price to what I'm paying and is it going to deliver me something better? Okay, done. And they would switch over and they wouldn't ask for that much help. Um, or they, you know, and they just, they were a sophisticated business. Yeah. And so then we started going after those top people. And so we started getting accounts that were, much bigger, like a hundred thousand subscribers, and you know, and we have we have accounts that are growing by five hundred to a thousand subscribers a day now. Wow! And and so then we needed a term that defined them. Yeah. And so from the mastermind retreat um, that I did with uh, who's there? So James Clear, uh, Barrett Brooks, Caleb Logic, um, and another guy that I that I just met, uh, Matthew was there and um, we talked through that messaging and that kind of problem for about an hour and came up with email marketing for professional bloggers and that's worked really well. And so now we're just going after getting these big accounts to switch and we do the full migration for them and everything. Yeah. Um, because if you get someone who's paying $500 a month to switch over, uh, you look at the lifetime value over that even over just a year, it's totally worth spending five or six hours in a day to migrate everything. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a couple of things here. One is uh, Amy Hoy has this great quote where she says, I think it's Amy, where she says, uh, target people already in motion. Mm -hmm. And I, I think for something like this, I could totally see how that would play out. Because if you're brand new and you've never built anything or written anything and you try and you get burnt out or you don't have any content or you don't have a point of view... I could see, you know, being maybe being excited about a product, but when when it comes time to pay, it's like, well, I I'm never gonna, I, I don't I don't have the momentum. But if someone already has momentum, and they're already paying for something, um, that the the challenge, of course, is getting them to switch. I think that's one of the hardest right. things to do in software. Is people are already entrenched. They've got their process. They've got their habit. Uh, it's way easier to let something ride than to, you know, have to come up, do something else. So how do you get them to switch? How do you convince them? What's that sales call look like? So 
there, you're right. There's one whole process of getting them to understand and see the value in ConvertKit. And then, but then there's that whole other obstacle of they're like, okay, but I, let's be honest, I don't want to do any work. Like, yeah, it, what I'm doing now functions. Let's, you know, yeah, it's making well, me money. Let's leave it at that. So really, what just, comes down and to not just work though. Like that's one part, but I can I can come up with a bunch of objections to ConvertKit. Like Mailchimp has more integrations than you guys mm -hmm. do. Mailchimp is you know been around forever. Mailchimp has more features. You know, there's a this big list. I'm actually I'm surprised you're able to convince anyone to to, to switch. So, I, I, so how do you do? What's the deal? So a big part of it comes down to we built ConvertKit for people exactly like myself and whoever I'm talking to in mind. And so I point to a lot of things like, you know, we have dedicated analytics on every single form. And so one thing that I point to people is like, okay, your newsletter page. How, what conversion rate do you get on that? And people tend to go, I'd say 90% of people say, uh, I don't know. I think it converts decently. And then there's about 10% that says, oh, well, I set up goals in Google Analytics and I have this tracking and, and here's what it converts at. Yeah. And then when I say, like, okay, that, that post that you got on Hacker News, how did that traffic compare to, in conversion rate, how did that compare to uh, the rest of the traffic to that blog post for converting? And they have no idea. And so when I say, oh, we have all of that built in, you don't have to do anything, um, then that really gets them gets them excited. And so there's a bunch of things like that where um, I can just demonstrate we don't have the level of features that MailChimp does, but everything we do have was built exactly for people like you and I. And yeah. everything we build in the future is going to be built exactly for people like you and I. Yeah. And that that tends to be pretty compelling for people. And then people will love uh, the really clean, simple user experience. One thing that we get a lot, um, especially on like our course creation and stuff like that, someone says, I can't remember who said this, but they said, your, your user interface is okay, but your user experience is really good. Hmm. And they said that the, the reverse of it, they felt like MailChimp was the reverse. Um, uh, I, I wish this person would write the blog post. Um, yeah, I know they listen to the to the show, uh, <laughs> so maybe they will. But basically, I was talking with a friend, and he, and he and he said, Mailchimp has a really great UI, but their UX is terrible. And and that's something that I think is totally true because they have all the little polish there, and they have so many fantastic details, but they're missing the core user experience for people like like us. And so yeah. Um, I, thought the, I always thought that the killer feature of ConvertKit was the that you actually have a template, um, like your template for course courses actually has these suggested steps, and I always thought that was the that was the killer feature because getting started is always the hardest part, and you kind of just I can fit my content into these slots, um, whereas uh, Mailchimp is very it's a blank slate when you're creating uh, any sort of automation. So I, I always thought that was brilliant, that this idea that you're you're helping people out by giving them a template. Yeah, we we well that one comes from Patrick McKenzie. Uh, that was his suggestion, and huh. uh, and it's his template of, of the dates that they're sent on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we're trying to do as much of that as possible. Soon we'll have a little selector. So when you go to create a new course, it'll ask you what kind of course. You want oh, to create, and then it'll the templates will be even more advanced as far as. Um, what do you mean? What kind of course? Uh, you might have like a three email course to just introduce people to your newsletter. Okay. Right, and so that would have some preset dates in there, or you might just want a blank one where you want nothing in there because you're just going to write something from scratch. Um, I have another one that I wrote uh, with help from Tim Grawl of that's about um, introducing people to your newsletter. And so that one's actually like a full Mad Lib style. Like oh, wow. almost all the content is there. And so you just drop in, in like three places per email, you just edit it and um, you're good to go. So really helping people with that. Because um, yeah. it's just like introduce people to your best content, tell them a little more about who you are, um, tell them about your book, uh, more great content, and then uh, another a little pitch for your book and with a testimonial in it. Hmm. And that's a, a decent um, onboarding experience. It's way better than nothing. Yeah. And so you get them started with 
with something, and it's and it really is this plug and play template. Um, and you can change yeah. as much as you want about it, um, but it gets people started uh, right away. I guess. Yeah, yeah, that is that is key. So would you say so right now? Because the big announcement today is that since you announced. Um, since you wrote your last post where you said, you know, I finally met my goal of 5K MRR, since then you've added another $1,200 in MRR, which is amazing. Um, what, <laughs> so how, how did that happen? Can that keep going? Are you riding the money train now? Um, well, so I, I guess the first thing is I've seen we have a little bit of a pattern of growth, and yeah. I've seen it stall out twice now and you can see that on the MRR chart yeah. um, and I've seen it start up again and so and I can point to the reasons at each time um, yeah. but really what it comes down to is direct sales and having conversations with people um, and so I just have this sales pipeline and so if I talk to somebody on Twitter and it comes out that they want to sign up for or that they're interested in ConvertKit before I would say uh, great, we'd love to have you, and that would be it. Now I add them to a Trello board, um, yeah. and if you go to nathanberry.com slash 5K, you can see that post and a screenshot of the Trello board. I was going to say I could screen share it, but I can't because it has everybody's names on it. Um, <laughs> but the, the screenshot on the post has everybody's names uh, grayed out. Grayed out, um, yeah. But so then I, like, I use this crazy sales technique of, I actually follow up with people, <laughs> um, which only took me a few years to learn. <laughs> so we were at MicroConf Europe, uh, whenever that was, beginning of November. So I yeah. just went down this road, or maybe it was in October, I can't remember, and uh, and of of doing these direct sales, and Trello has been great for it, especially because they have a really good iPhone app. Yeah. So uh, Ryan Delk and I are talking to like two other people, and. And we have this conversation. Someone's interested in ConvertKit, and you know we talk through it. And then after the conversation ends, those two wander off, and so it's just Ryan and I. And I pull out my phone and I pull up my ConvertKit sales Trello board and I add them in. And I, you know I hit save and put my phone away. And Ryan's just looking at me. <laughs> and he goes, "I've been trying to get you to do that for two years. <laughs> and it's just keep track of conversations and follow up with people." Yeah. And so it took me forever to learn, but uh, it works really well. Yeah, <laughs> and so I have columns of people to contact, contacted, uh, and then whether they're interested, and then very likely to sign up, and then became a customer. Yeah, and you're managing. That's your job. You're managing all that stuff. Yeah, that's my job. Um, I have a bit of an advantage because um, I have name recognition in the space. Yeah. So cold emails aren't exactly cold emails. Yeah. Like there's somebody who wrote a a technical development book that did really well and it was on Hacker News and um, uh, and so I went to his site and I was like oh I'll, you know I'll send him an email reach out and um, but then on his contact page he had a phone number and so I thought yeah I'll just call him <laughs> and so you know I called him and he answered and I said hey you know this is Nathan Berry and I started to say a little more and he said I know who you are <laughs> I'm like you know, it turns out he'd read authority and um, some things like that. And so yeah. that makes the sales process that much easier. Yeah, yeah, that's that's awesome. And a little bit surprising in some ways because we're it feels like we're finally getting out of this stage where everyone thinks that SaaS is just um, set it and forget it once you get the once you get your SEO right, once you get your landing page right, once you get your kind of uh, digital funnel right, you can just that's it. You're done. And it seems like there's a lot more people talking about sales now. And you're saying for you, this growth is all sales. Yeah. And it, is I, it say 80% sales? Yeah. 80%. 80%. So is it? And is it down to like, uh, you know, if you don't do as good next month, is it just because you have less people in the pipeline? Like, can you attribute it that that closely? Um, I don't know that I have enough. Um... I, I don't know that I've spent enough time to know that for sure. You yeah. know, enough uh, enough data. But I will actually, yeah, because the two weeks that I spent in Thailand, you can see, to, you know, January 18th to 30th, you go look at that on the MRR chart, and yeah. you can see <laughs> zero growth and a very slight decline. Yeah. Uh, and so, 
and you have to keep in mind that MRR chart isn't exactly accurate because it's a rolling daily average, and so it's going to fluctuate. Like, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised, you know, today we're at 6,200. I wouldn't be surprised if tomorrow we're just below 6,000. You, you know, it's going to... Yeah. Um, but the trend is what matters. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, if I, if I slack off on sales, I can immediately see... Uh, I can see the results. Or yeah. Two weeks later, I can see the results. And and so what what's your when you look forward? What's your plan? Um, I know that you like we talk about that fifty grand that you and your wife invested in. Uh, you know the the that money's running out, obviously. Yeah, we have twenty six thousand uh, left. You have twenty six thousand left, and what's like what's your burn rate? How much are you spending every month? Uh, so we're spending about thirteen thousand every month. And that goes up slightly every month um, because, like, our mail gun bills, you know, we're now sending millions of emails, whereas five months ago we were sending 100 or 200,000, you know? Yeah. Um, so that leaves you about 26,000 left. Yeah. And so, uh, do you, like, are you, do you think you're going to be able to, are you going to run out of money? Are you going to, what's the, what's going to happen here? I think we're going to run out of money. Okay. Um, because um, I don't expect these growth percentages to keep up. Yeah. Though I kept saying that all the way along, and they have. Yeah. Um, you know, because like early on, I was like, "Whoa, twenty or thirty percent monthly growth. That, that's awesome." Yeah. And then I was thinking about it, like, "Well, that's really only you know five hundred dollars of MRR." Or, and then later, it was like, "Well, that's only a thousand dollars of MRR." Yeah. And and then it has kept up. So. Um, so we'll see on that. But even if we get to the point where we're just adding the absolute numbers, you know, if we're just adding twelve hundred dollars a month uh, to MRR instead of thirty percent monthly growth, that's still acceptable, mm -hmm. um, and and that's going to turn into a real business in, in not that long. Um, What's your goal for break even? What's your personal goal? When do you want to see it it start to make money? And by start to make money, you're still not paying yourself in this either. Right. So we're talking yeah. about, I don't, is there a term for that? <laughs> what, what's the term for we're break even, but we're not paying the founder money? <laughs> a startup. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, when, when do you see it breaking even and, you know, getting to the point where you're paying all the bills and you're paying for everyone? Um, so, I mean, based on our, our current... I, our current growth, I'd say at about fifteen thousand, um, but that still wouldn't pay me anything. Yeah. Um, and so probably twenty thousand is when I start getting paid. Yeah. But even at that point, you know, I see, I see all this potential of making the product better. Yeah. And so I want to hire another developer. Um, you know, probably even before I I pay myself. Um, yeah. So you want to invest? You want to keep investing back in the business? Yeah, I do, because I, I see that that paid off. There's no way we could have had this growth if I hadn't hired a full-time developer to yeah. lead the team and and really just build out these amazing integrations. And like, if you go look at um, go look at our Gumroad integration, um, I think it's it's just on the blog. It's like the second most recent post. Yeah, um, and. Uh, it's really, really slick. Like you can get your products from a sale from Gumroad into ConvertKit in well, in the video I do it in 47 seconds. Yeah. Um, and so, like that kind of thing, you just you have to have a a fantastic team. And so, like David, my lead developer, uh, he's he and I have worked together in various things um, over the last probably six or seven years. Um, but he's a great hybrid designer and developer, um, and so he just creates really fantastic experiences that I wasn't even involved in the design process on. And yeah. he's just like, oh yeah, there you go. And so I really needed him on board to have this growth. It wasn't like I could have taken the product that we had in October and really focused on sales and gotten to the point I was at. Yeah. Um, it required that fifty grand investment, I think, to have the money to hire people to. So if that's that. if that's true. You know, why not go out and get, you've got name recognition right now. There's probably a lot of, you're probably on the radar of some angels and some VC firms. Why not go out and just get them to pump money in and you can pump some money out? 
Yeah, and that's something that's come up a lot in the last, really the last two weeks since I announced that we finally hit 5K. Yeah. Um, that got people's attention. It did, and I thought it wouldn't to some extent. For me, that was like closing the chapter on the whole web app challenge thing because that was the original goal, and, and so, you know, so I, I really needed to write that post. But it really got people's attention, and I was surprised it got people's attention in the, the startup VC in that whole world. And I was like, really? We're at $5,000 a month. Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm thrilled with the, the progress, and, and then we finally, and it's a huge achievement for me, but guys, you know that $5,000 is a tiny amount of money, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, you know? <laughs> but then somebody made a comment about, well, you should apply to Y Combinator, and someone else made a comment like, well, but they require crazy week over week growth. And so I looked it up, and what Paul Graham said was five to seven percent week over week growth is what he wants to see. And I was like, oh, that's what we've been doing. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and so it, I've had a bunch of conversations. People from 500 startups reached out. Um, uh, no one directly from Y Combinator reached out, but um, a few people closely affiliated with them, you know, said like, hey, have you considered? You know, they're like. I don't know if applications close tonight or tomorrow, but they were basically like, "Hey, it's still available." Yeah. Um, Did you consider it? Like, is that something you would even consider? Or. Yeah, I I did I did consider it, um, and I had a long conversation uh, with someone who's really well known and trusted in this space, and basically he outlined. Um, just that it would put the company on a different trajectory. And and he pointed out that you know let's say you hit that fifty grand in monthly recurring revenue, if if you're bootstrapped that's fantastic, you know then it's turned into something like uh, Amy and Thomas's Freckle, you know they've got a substantial business, um, they can work on it exactly on their own terms and all of that. And he said, but if you take funding and you get to fifty grand a month, your business is a failure, and investors will probably ask that you shut it down. So that mm-hmm. they can write that off, count it as a loss, and move on to things that are actually going to be worthwhile. Yeah. And, and he was saying even higher numbers, hundred grand monthly recurring revenue, mm, depending on how much capital you took, probably still a failure. Yeah. Um, but the other thing is, even though I am uh, very very cash poor at the moment, um, I am losing money every month. Um, <laughs> Uh, I I still have these these books and courses that people absolutely love, and I have this this audience that's very kind to me. Um, and so if I need to, I can go back and I can, you know, actually blog more, um, and and really focus on all these other things. And I can I can do a product launch, or I can promote these other things, or do partnerships, and come up with say another $25,000 pretty easily. Yeah. And so uh, this is something that uh, I asked Ryan Delk's advice on quite a bit. And, you know, comparing, like, these accelerators to what I could do on my own. Mm-hmm. And he was pointing out that, hey, the amount of capital they're going to give you is actually relatively small. Yeah. And, and you could get similar amounts of capital by taking, say, a month off of focusing on ConvertKit and just, and then and focusing on the, the books and courses and training side of things, um, and come up with twenty five to fifty thousand dollars, and then be able to go heads down and convert it again for a while without having to give up, give up any equity. Yeah, that's a good point. All the all the time you'd spend fundraising, and uh, signing those deals and figuring all that stuff out, you might as well have just done it yourself. In your in your situation, anyway. Right, and. I, I mean, I'm sure there are other substantial benefits that I'd be missing out on. Um, also, there may be a time to raise money down the road. I'm not ruling it out. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Jason Cohen with WP Engine um, did a good job of of that kind of thing. I think he, yeah. I think he self-funded and bootstrapped for a long time. Yeah. Uh, and then got some substantial traction and then raised money. Yeah. Um, and so. Once they, especially once they figured out their their marketing funnel, they found out something that worked, and they wanted to double down on it. Right. So they brought in the money then. And I think that's something that I'm trying to think who I first heard this from. Maybe Darmesh Shah of HubSpot. Yeah. Um, where he was saying, 
once you come up with a predictable thing where you can put in one dollar and and get out two or three dollars, then mm-hmm. he's like, then you take funding. Yeah. Uh, uh, but you know, companies that inspire me would be like uh, who have taken funding would be like Campaign Monitor. Um, mm-hmm. You know, they bootstrapped for so long, and they're like, oh, by the way, we just raised a quarter million. Yeah. Not sorry, a quarter. Three hundred, three hundred and fifty. I thought. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I don't remember the exact number, but somewhere in the two hundred fifty to three hundred fifty million dollar range. Yeah. Because they finally wanted the founders wanted liquidity and. Oh, you're right. Two hundred fifty mil, which is an yeah. enormous amount of money. Right, and they they raised it on amazing terms because they'd built an amazing business. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. so my goal is not to stop at like a um, kind of a bootstrapped business level. My my goal is not to get to fifty grand a month and stop. My my goal is to build something really substantial. Um, well, well, keep, still keeping the team relatively small. Uh, I have no desire to manage like seventy people. Yeah. But, but twenty seems like. Um, I don't know. A that good business. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. So we'll see. Yeah. Well, this is awesome. I love catching you at this stage. I'm glad we could have this chat at this stage because there's a lot of kind of dynamics here. One, uh, this idea of having done really well and gotten comfortable. Two, this idea of being actually scared and like I'm, I'm putting all our money, all of our cash into this and um, you know, having to convince your wife and then, you know, kind of feeling like you're doing this and knowing you're going to run out of money again. Mm-hmm. And knowing that, you know, this is like, this is a really kind of long play, um, especially if you look at some of those companies you talked about. They've been building these businesses for 10 years and you're in year two, but really you're kind of in year one in a sense because this is really where you you kind of figured it out and you're pushing on it. Yeah, though... And for a while, I was really discouraged about that. Yeah. Of how long it took to come to this point. But then I was reading an article by uh, Jason Lemkin. Um, he writes at saster.com. S-A-A-S-T-R.com. Yeah. And he has an article that came out really recently about um, how it takes two years to get uh, to get traction. Yeah. For, for a SaaS company to get traction. And I looked at that and I went... I don't know if I just love this article because it describes me exactly, or <laughs> if it's really good advice and totally true. But yeah, you know, um, and he pointed to a lot of good examples of companies that t- took them two years, uh, yeah. and so I'm okay with that. You know, yeah. and we did a lot in those two years. We built a really solid product. Um, it's just now that everything is moving so much faster. Yeah. Yeah, well, it'll be it'll be cool to um, oh here I've just found this post. It'll be cool to keep watching because I think there's there's a bunch of things reasons that I like this conversation. One is it shows how hard SaaS is. Uh, everyone That's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life by far. Well, there we go. Yeah, it it shows you how hard it is, and you know in some ways you were in a a great position that a lot of people aren't in, in that you did have 50k even to put in. Um, so I think it's just great to kind of watch you do this, and right now the 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 growth and everything is exciting, especially seeing that you're getting it from doing it the old-fashioned way, calling people up. Yeah, it's great. So thanks for taking the time, man. Yeah, uh, thanks for thanks for doing it, and I, I could talk about this stuff all day long. It's great. <laughs> well, now you got to get back to making those sales calls. So yes, that's uh, right. <laughs> and actually, I have a bunch of code to write as well. Because cool. Yep. Well, thanks for taking the time. We'll catch up. Let's let's do another one of these in a few months and just touch base, see where you're at. Sounds good. I'd like All right. That. Cool, man. See you later. See ya. Bye. All right. That's it for this week. You can follow Nathan on Twitter at Nathan Barry, go check out ConvertKit. That's ConvertKit.com. You want to follow me on Twitter? I'm the letter M, the letter I, Justin, M-I, Justin on Twitter. And like I said, go check out the other show, buildandlaunch.net. And if you want, you can also rate and review this show on iTunes. Rating and reviewing the show helps other people find it. 
So you can do that by going to iTunes and searching for product people. Thanks so much for listening, folks. I've got a few more episodes in the pipe, so stay subscribed to this feed. And if you want the show notes for today's episode, productpeople.tv. Thanks again, folks. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Almost forgot all this great music is provided by Striker, striker striker-metal.com. Podcast hosting is provided by Transistor.fm. They host our MP3 files, generate our RSS feed, provide us with analytics, and help us distribute the show to Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. If you want to start your own podcast or you want to switch to Transistor, go to Transistor.fm slash Justin and get 15% off your first year.